Well, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. And can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was just looking at the email that uh, you distributed and I was just looking at my bio. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the newsletter, right? Yes, the newsletter, which is very exciting to see because I'm following Call for Curators since three, four years. It's very nice to see myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the whole goal of the membership program, to introduce the practice and the experience of the, our member curators to the wider community. Yes. And yeah, I think people are joining. Um, so hello, everyone. And thanks for joining this uh, Call for Curators members program. I'm Nona, today's host. And uh, this is our new format for introducing members of Call for Curators, as I said before, to share the curatorial practices and experience of our members. Uh, for those who are attending this session for the first time, I would recommend to uh, to check the membership options which Call for Curator provides, um, which allows the exclusive uh, access to the opportunities and the open calls for curators around the globe. And you can find all the information in our link in bio. Can I confess and... something? Sorry? Can I confess something? <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, I found my job at Documenta 15 through Call for Curators. Wow! Da -da -da -da. <laughs> really? It's exciting <laughs> news, just there. So happy to hear that. You should do call for curators success stories. I'm one of them, I think. I use your newsletter a lot, and like I said, I'm, I, my current job is through call for curators newsletter. Great, so. great. That's awesome to know that uh, members really find uh, the jobs through through the call for curators and that it's really useful and our community is growing so fast. So I hope those people who are watching will share your experience and will be actively following the newsletter and all the open calls which we deliver weekly. Yes, it's very, very useful. I have like, I have like five or four open calls that I reserved, but like the deadline is tomorrow. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. But yes, I'm really, I am a fan and member of your newsletter for a very long time. And I think I benefit a lot. And I suggest to all the curators and art professionals, artists, everyone should have a look and benefit. Thank you so much. Yeah, same for me, honestly. I've been subscribed to Call for Curators for a long time. And especially during pandemic, it was, uh, it was of a great help to me mm. to connected to the world of art which was stagnated for such a long period of time so yeah i'm, I'm happy we share this uh, this love for call for curators <laughs> <laughs> yes i think it's very important because like uh art let's say art jobs or art industry is not like others jobs are not posted on linkedin maybe very few like there's no platform and Unfortunately, most of the things are very network based and I think this this really feeds an open uh, area that we all we all need and I think that's why it's very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. We also try to diversify it as much as po as more as possible so to address different stages of development of curators like some emerging curators or professionals established so mm -hmm. yeah if also anyone has any kind of feedback, feel free to email us or text us. We would be happy to know about your experience of members. So, yeah, please feel free to give your feedback. Um, and, um, yeah, Gözde, I haven't uh, introduced you properly. <laughs> please. So, <laughs> um, maybe some people already read some information in our... Um, post but I still would like to say that um, our guest is Gilste, uh is an art historian, researcher, curator and writer who is based between Istanbul and Kassel. And um, yeah our session will consist of two parts. First is a quick quiz and the second one is more like open questions related to your practice. And I think we can start from a quick questions. Yes, of course. You're ready? I was just inviting more of my friends to come. <laughs> so I don't have time for that, I guess. 
Yes, please. Uh, there are quite a lot of people I see. It's very nice. I know um, my one of my collectives. It's called the Urban the Urban Arts Collective. I think they will be very interested to join. And I was sure. sending them on Instagram. Sure, sure. And yes, I can have your questions, I think, now. Yeah, we can start. Uh, so, yeah, since your practice is so multidisciplinary, I would like to ask this question about uh, which intersection do you find the most interesting? Is it art and technology, art and biology, or art and urbanism? Well, I think it's a bit obvious in, in my practice that I'm very interested in art and biology, but not only biology. I think I'm very interested in science and arts, but science can be anything. Like, it's a, it's a vast field. Uh, but I think I'm very, very interested in evolutionary biology and that really looks at evolution and those those intersections where human, animal, non-human and all the other species coincide and we look at the differences, similarities. And as, a, as it's, it's very important that with evolutionary science, as we all know, Charles Darwin, I think the whole concept of human centrism took a huge, let's say, punch. That's, a, that's not a good word to say, maybe like he took a huge um, um, realization that humans are not the center or that we are animals themselves, actually. So I'm very excited about these kind of discoveries and uh, research. And this also in involves like cognitive science, behavioral science, uh, ecological science, let's say, or zoology. So I'm, I think in general, just like everyone, I'm very interested in general science, but I think what really, what I'm really passionate is to look at the animal in many sense and animal behavior, animal behavioral science or zoology, or like I said, interspecies. It can be also in philosophy or psychology, all types of uh, both sciences. I'm very interested in these and yeah. Great. Excites me. <laughs> I will get back to this uh, topic uh, in the next part again. Yes. Um, the next question from Quiz is, um, so there is this list of quotes about the future, which is curated by Hans Sulich Obris. And um, he presented this list uh, during his uh, lecture at UN Climate uh, Conference in Copenhagen. And uh, this list consists of a lot of quotes by different artists, curators, designers, and other creative mm -hmm. creatives. And I would like to offer you the three quotes and to ask you to choose which one you prefer, or maybe you have your own, own quote about that. So the first one is, uh, the future will be repeated by Marlene Dumas. Mm -hmm. the second one is, the future will be so subjective by Tino Segal. And the third one is, the future is a dog by mm -hmm. Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Mouron. So these are the three quotes about the future and um, yeah, which one would you choose or maybe you would create your own quote about the future? Uh, ooh, uh, okay, when I first received these quotes from you, I can say the first two, the future will be repeated and future will be so subjective is actually not the future. I think it's today, what the world we're living in. And what I can add about is recently I am what the world is looking like and what I'm, I'm trying to think of what's happening. I am always trying to debunk my belief on progress. And it kind of explains a lot when I reject progress and I'm like, okay, maybe there's no progress. Maybe bro progress is, is a lie that we learned with capitalism and the growth idea. And maybe we're so like, focused on progressing, which also puts an, on the individual a lot of pressure because we live everything, we perceive everything as a growth, but we yeah. don't, never really think what it means. But then in general, like the future today and the past, I, I, I can see a lot of things repeating. 
that's for sure. Like, it looks a bit different, but we still have colonialism, we still have oppression, we still have violence, we still have many, many horrible situations going on. So it's like, it feels like it's a repetition. It's like in a loop, but looks different. So I would say it's today, um, something that I've been thinking. Another thing, the future will be so subjective by Tino Segal is also today because uh, we're living in a post-truth era where everything, every there's no factual information left or there is, but no one really cares about it anymore. So the whole reality, the whole understanding of everything is very, very subjective. And that's the core of post-truth era, what it means. And the future is a dog. I would love that, <laughs> of course. I would like to become oh. a dog myself. Uh, a house dog, I would say. Or a <laughs> dog that, uh, like my dogs, I would like to become my dog in the future. Uh, but I've checked this quote, and it's from uh, Herzog and Moy Moron. So they're like uh, dual architects. And actually, I want to say something. The full quote is like, first they say in English, the future is a dog. And then in French, they say, la venise la femme. And la venise la femme is like, future is woman. And yeah. I just love this because it kind of, it, it's, it's kind of what I'm trying to say as a feminist and a vegan animal activist, let's say like that. I always try to tell that actually in front of, uh, in front of human centrism against the Western wild male perspective, the animal and the woman are actually the other. We are othered. And I, I love that idea that as a woman and as a dog or as a non-human animal, let's say, they are on the other side of the ruling white male patriarchy. So I think this quote in its total, I love it. I don't know why they first in English and then the French is not exactly the translation. So it's yes. also interesting that, uh, well, in the book of uh, Obris, mm -hmm. uh, the whole article, mm. this list, is titled as The Future is Dog. Mm. And there is no, there is no the second part. Mm. And you can only find the second part when you go directly to the code. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank yes. you for bringing that. Yes, because... so interesting. Like they say, the future is a dog, and then la venise la femme, the future is woman. It's perfect for me because in this quote, dog and the woman are the same, which what I'm trying to express. But also, um, of course, I would love that the future is a non-human animal. I think we really need that shift. Definitely. Yeah. That would be amazing. <laughs> but what it means is a huge conversation and requires yeah. a lot of imagination as well. Absolutely. Thank you. It was a very interesting answer. And the last question from Quiz is about what do you think is the strongest enemy of art? Is it time? Is it money? Or art has no enemies at all? Um, I'm going to answer money. I think it's, it's, it's a dominant answer. I would say a lot of people like in this, let's say, field, in this industry, money is... I don't like enemy sounds very cruel because there are situations where we find the money and it becomes a friend. It's, it's, it's an ally. It's a need. But in terms of like the West understanding of the obstacle as an obstacle, not an enemy, money funding, uh, finding support is one of the biggest obstacles in art, especially mm -hmm. for, for non-Western countries. I am from Turkey and for the whole global south or non-western countries it's a big big obstacle to to really sustain your artistic practice your curatorial practice uh, or in a creative field it's very difficult but there are also other obstacles like uh, autocracy autocratic regimes pressure non-freedom of expression these are also bigger obstacles sometimes more bigger than the money obstacle but because you have these answers <laughs> i will choose money <laughs> yes but we can overcome this there are ways to overcome this and we should not be demotivated because of this obstacle recently my old uh, master studies they did a kickstarter for their uh, exhibitions and they found the money from kickstarter so there are ways to yeah. overcome these obstacles 
uh, yeah. uh, versus the very serious obstacles. Absolutely. As you mentioned, um, the freedom of expression is one of the fundamental things, which even if you have money, you can't do mm -hmm. anything if you don't mm -hmm. have freedom of expression. So that was a very important point. Well, um, okay, now we can switch to the open questions and talk about your practice more. Um, since you since you work for Documenta and you found this uh, job through the call for curators, exactly. <laughs> uh, I was going to ask about it, like how did you find it, and now we know about it already. And now I would like to just um, ask about maybe you could talk more about your role, mm -hmm. about highlights, mm -hmm. uh, curators and artists, or other people who are watching us just to know your perspective and your suggestions or just experience? Of course. Um, well, I'm, I'm one of the assistant curators at Documenta 15 and we are in total, we should be like six or seven. And we grew in numbers throughout, throughout time. And that's a common thing in Documenta. Towards you get closer to the opening, the 100 days, the company, I don't want to say company, the organization, the institution hires more, more and more people. And I'm one of them. And we directly work with the artistic team. Uh, and this year's Documenta 15's artistic team is Ruang Grupa from Indonesia. And they invited uh, five more uh, curators around the world. And a team of 14, uh, let's say, artists, curators, they are the artistic team and we're working directly with them, but we're also working directly with the institution. So we, and we also directly work with the artists. So there's a lot of collectives and artists this year uh, in Documenta 15 and we, we have to share the amount of collectives and artists within ourselves. I am currently working with 13 artists slash collective. And in total, that would be like maybe 50, 60 artists, <laughs> but mm -hmm. because there are collectives and collectives have 20, 20 artists, maybe sometimes more artists in their collective. And yeah, since uh, a year and it's exactly a year now, we, I've, I've joined the team and I've, I've worked with the artists from their initial proposals and to realize the whole, uh, witness the whole process from uh, curatorial decisions, production decisions, also, we're working for their public program, how they want to mediate their work to the public. And also we help them with their travel, with their visit to Kassel and all of that. The difference, a very big difference of Documenta 15 would be that we work very closely with Kassel people, like people who live here. And a lot of artists and collectives are very interested in that too. They don't want to just bring something in display, but they're, we are working with a lot of initiatives, collectives within Kassel, and it's very collaborative. We introduce them, we look at how, how they can work together. So it's a, it's a very big process and it, it's a lot of people are involved, but I think this time Kassel ecosystem is, I mean, we call it Kassel ecosystem, are very, very involved and um, which, which creates a very unique, like collaborative thing. Yeah, so that's kind of what I do. <laughs> currently, oh, yeah, currently we have one of the, we are one of the, uh, and we call this Lumung artist. We don't call them documenta artists, although they are documenta artists. Uh, I am working with one of the co collectives from Bangladesh and uh, they're called Brito Arts Trust and for Brito we're building a social kitchen and currently we just finished some open call designs and I'm going to go to like um, organizations and collectives and initiatives, community centers that work with, that has a migrant background or um, refugees or post post immigrant families and communities and I will ask them if they would like to cook. So that's part of my job as well. I have to reach these communities and ask if they would be interested to take part. So it's very um, relational uh, yeah. method. Yeah, very art creative, but like in the end, it's actually cooking. But mm -hmm. as you know now, it's every, most of the contemporary art is socially engaging art. So it's, I would say it's what's happening. I really like this trend, by the way, 
yeah, it's amazing. The socially engaged art. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's 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 moving from material or let's say plastic arts into more like really activating or people involving, but it it's also very difficult because suddenly you have to reach a community and there is always this who are you kind of attitude why do i go to an african community yeah. or a kenya community and why do i ask them to cook <laughs> but yeah that's that's part of it and it, it has a lot of beauty and difficulty at the same time thank you well honestly i would like to hear even more and to talk more about it but that's probably the whole different conversation you can surely <laughs> yeah <laughs> So the next question I would like to ask um, again about the intersection of different fields in your practice. Um, and I would like to outline that um, you did your master's degree in art history at Istanbul University with a dissertation on animal figures in contemporary art. Uh -huh. You address a lot of animal studies, post-human discourse, ecology, women-animal relations and you identify as a vegan feminist activist. Mm -hmm. And um, um, again, for those who are listening, maybe for emerging curators, um, could you please share some advices or um, how, how was your path? Like, how could you incorporate these topics into your curatorial practice? Because from my own experience, uh, I could say that sometimes it's a struggle mm -hmm. to put these like different interests together or to incorporate uh, some like radically different topics or practices into your curatorial work. So maybe you could just share how, what was your approach or how did it all start or just any kind of um, highlights. Good question. I have to think. Well, actually, my bachelor's economics and gender studies. So I was before all this animal question came to my life. I was, let's say, on the path of feminism and questioning patriarchy. But I was, I'm an economist. I did my inner study in gender. But I always thought I, I did the wrong studies. I wish I did like a more social science in terms of like maybe sociology or psychology. But then I, I didn't know what to do and how to relate to arts. And then I did my master's in artistry and I had a great teacher. And she really supported me in this question of the animal, which is not a common thing. Still today, still today, internationally, it is not a big question. Uh, and we are excited. We can see lots of theories about uh, animals and non-human animals and interspecies, but it's still, I think, compared to the big questions, it's still very small. Did I lose you? Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. No, no? Yes. Oh, I lost. Um, yes. Does it work right now? You're, you're pixelated, <laughs> but it's no. okay. I can continue if you can hear me. Everyone can hear me. Uh, yeah, I can hear you and I can see you well. Okay, then I continue. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Then, yeah, so, so my teacher in masters, in artistry masters, like really encouraged me to look at this topic that is also, I think, I don't want to talk that, I don't want to exaggerate, but one of the first theses that looked at the animal in the contemporary art. It was not really Turkey focused, it was more like Western artistry. I started looking at ancient Greece because that's where artistry starts, the Western artistry. I would love to look at non Western, by the way, it's one of maybe my future research. But then I take it all the way to, let's say, Pierre Hughes' uh, works until let's say 2000, 2015, 2010, um, mm -hmm. animals in contemporary art. And especially it was very interesting to look performance art that use live animals and what it means. And the final part of the thesis says, sorry, I'm talking about a lot about my thesis, but it has a part where it, it gives a suggestion on how to make it ethical, which is also very crucial, I think. 
Absolutely. Whoever is interested, the thesis is in Turkish, is in my academia website. I hope to translate it very soon. And then I did... And then I was looking for ways to like go outside of Turkey and I found this curating studies, Master of Advanced Studies in Z Zurich University of Arts. And again, I had a great teacher and she kind of guided me into, I didn't know because I'm, I have very interesting topics. Like I have like ecology questions. I want to work on climate crises. I want to work on the animal and I'm also a feminist. So I'm like, how can I bring this all together? And then I was introduced to post-human theory. And in my mind, it brought everything together. It brought everything together because they had a common enemy. Enemy is a strong word, but let's say it had a common counter obstacle and which was the, which was the human centrism. So, and this human, when we say human in post-human theory, I mean, it depends which theory you're reading, but one part of post-human theory says human centrism, the human word human and human centrism refers to Western wild privilege male. And mm -mm. all the others, all the others come together against this human because we are not human. We are not even considered human enough to be in the center. Uh, sick people are not considered, let's say, the fable people are not in the center. Non-Western people are not in the center. Animals, non-human species, plants, they're not in the center. So I kind of found this theory very satisfying because it kind of put every, every one of us, maybe 90%, 99% of the world on the same side, which is maybe the, uh, what we need to do. We have to come together, you know, but of course it's, it has its own difficulties, but for me, that was very exciting, but I was doing a curatorial study, so I have to relate mm -hmm. to posthuman to curating, which was my challenge, you know, you can't just yeah, exactly say abstract that. things. So I started oh. to look at practices and think how a curator can help, like, go beyond anthropocentrism, and anthropocentrism mean human centrism. How can we make it happen? I mean, there are small suggestions where else I suggest let animals enter the museum by the way this is also not common they don't let animals enter for example your dog or your cat which is to begin with uh but there are also other let's say suggestions for the curators to to kind of one of them is very important is to let the audience and let the people take their time because if you if you just display in a short moment or if you do a show that that you don't give time, the relations are not built. So it's kind of like giving time and kind of like creating an environment where they can feel and understand. So those were like suggestions, but I still find it a bit challenging because yeah, it's, it's a difficult to bring post-human to curating because it's, it's, it's very, let's say future ahead kind of thinking. But yeah. as you, as we all know, the real life follows, I believe so, follows way later than theory. I mean, theory and philosophy goes ahead and then the real life follows step by step, hoping that it will follow, but it takes time. It takes time. So I have some of these suggestions in my thesis. And then also post theory kind of put, like we discussed, puts the woman as the other an animal as the other. So actually we all come together as the other. So that's how I kind of, in my mind, placed and positioned everything. And also we are living in Anthropocene, which is again caused by humans, the, the climate crises and not just climate, ecological crises, loss of biodiversity, everything is caused by the same. In my mind, it's very clear. The main problem is human centrism. So whatever I did, I tried to kind of bring different perspectives. But of course, one of the talks I had I think a year ago I was invited and there was a, there was a question, I think it, it relates, it says, even when I am talking, how can I not be human centered? Because these are my words and these are my brain, you know, oh. but I am actually, there's no escape from kind of anthropocentrism because maybe we're just talking and talking, but this is just talks, you know, maybe we're just centering each other all the time, but the human and post-human theory is not you and me. So actually, 
all the non-humans, women, non-Western, uh, let's say not healthy enough, not young, uh, neuro neurodivergent people, dis disabled people, all the, all the others are actually not considered as human. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. totally. So if, yeah, so actually <laughs> I, when I'm talking, when, when you're talking, we're not human centered because we mm -hmm. give our perspective. Um, also there was a, so your question was like, how do I bring these different fields? It kind of came together, but mm -hmm. I can honestly say I still have difficulty to, to kind of like find that revealing my Erica moment where I do a show and it talks about everything. I think it's all a trial, a trials in its own conditions and its own reality. So like not one that like hugs all of them. I don't have that one show that changed the whole thing, you know, and um, it's a bit of coincidence. It's a bit of saying yes to projects that come to me and kind of saying yes kind of saying no so it's kind of i would say definitely developing I like i am not an expert i'm trying to figure out i yeah. did an i did an event on ecological crisis debates where i invite scientists to talk about the ecological crisis it's actually not even art related on the one hand i did a show about um time linear time and the problems it brings on our understanding of ecology and how to sh shift that understanding and we invited some artists to display some of their works so it's all developing small pieces of bits of different fields that i'm interested in so ecology animal feminism and then some other bits i'm not doing so much of my own research during Documenta 15 because like, I'm an employee and I have these tasks that I have to deliver. Mm -hmm. But with some of the artists that I'm working with, I get the chance to talk and dive deeper into the subjects. But of course, it's not as satisfying as doing my own freelance where I can just develop my own interest, you know. So I think it's, it's okay to kind of develop with small projects and each time you try to come closer to what, what you're interested in, but sometimes you're not, sometimes it's something else. Gyoza, and um, is there any medium which you would prefer or which is your favorite one, which you like to incorporate in your shows or the projects uh, hmm. and which allows you to address the topics you address in your practice? I mean, I always, I'm, like since the be beginning we said like I'm very interested in science and yeah. I love listen like I'm such a school person like I love tests I love school I love like reading you know I'm like maybe <laughs> they they would use the word nerd but I don't know if that's a nice word in English but so I love to do talks I like to invite people and hear their perspective so even if I do a show, I try to add like a public program that or a, or a curatorial tour where we talk about it. Like I think maybe it's too direct, maybe it's not even art, art medium, but I just love organizing talks and conversations. I think that's one of my favorite. Invite people to talk. That's actually what you're doing. <laughs> I have to say you're very good at that. To exp in explaining and telling a story, so uh, fair enough. But yeah, I agree. I think it's very important component of the exhibitions when artists or curators give direct talks and talk about their artworks. It brings the audience closer in mm -hmm. open up question and uh, facilitates dialogue. So. Yeah, but this does this shouldn't mean that the exhibition we're doing or something we're doing is not enough on its own. It's just the medium I love so much. I love to listen to different perspective and have this conversation because I love to speak and listen. And maybe that's just what I like. But that shouldn't mean that the exhibition is enough is not enough on its own. Sometimes, of course, the works are our main <laughs> gold mine that we are borrowing from artists i think that's uh, the most valuable thing but i also try to 
in my artist to give an artist talk or I, I push them to like make maybe maybe make a Q&A or if not write a text so I think that's very that's more engaging for me I, I enjoy it a lot totally great well um, unfortunately we are coming to the end and we need to close this session but it was so interesting to talk to you Gyose thank you so much and Nona to get so many new uh, so many new points uh, about your practice about in general curatorial practice and this um, intersection of different fields and multidisciplinarity um, so thanks a lot for your time for joining us and for being member of call for curators I hope um, our audience also enjoyed this session and please keep an eye on our account and check our link in bio for more information about membership, about uh, all the programs and opportunities which we provide for curators. Um, well, and we need to say bye. Thank you so much for uh, giving me this chance to talk a bit about my practice. <laughs> And yeah, I'm also very open to whoever wants to meet and talk and collaborate. I'm always open for that. I'm always looking for people with the similar interests that we motivate each other. And um, thank you for inviting me. It's also good to have a look at what I've done because it's been so long since I look back, you know. And yeah, thank you. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining this. And we we'll see you soon during our next session. Thank you. Bye. Bye to everyone.